Uh, everything that God instituted in this world is a revelation of God, from natural revelation to looking at the leaves blowing in the wind and the birds flying in the air to seeing the moon, and then his special revelation, which is um, him speaking to various individuals through human history, providentially and sovereign, sovereignly uh, recording and preserving it objectively and without error, and incarnating himself in the person of Jesus Christ, and finally the Bible. Now, if, if you deny that the, what the system that is represented in the Christian scriptures is not necessary ontologically. See, the Bible isn't just a, a book about stories. It's representing a complete worldview of history and a system. So it's the system that the Word of God says about itself is indispensable. So either one will, when they, we familiarize ourselves with what the Bible teaches about in the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, and then in the last chapter, Jesus Christ is coming again to judge the living and the dead. What we find out is all throughout that that system is indispensable for human existence and human intelligibility. But if somebody goes, ah, that's just a storybook, man. I don't believe no Bronze Age gold herder book. I say, fine, have it your way. Then you start explaining to me the nature of history. You start explaining to me the nature of facts. You want to talk about light? You want to talk about photons? Really? How do you have universals in a world of unrelated particulars? What institutes universals so that there can be dogs and cats and trees and photons and molecules? Why is there unity amongst a myriad of diverse particles? And then it just happens that way. Well, the, you know what that's called? That's called a chance world. It just happens. If, if yeah, stuff just happens. the lottery happens all the time. Oh, okay. But no, okay. Well, all right. That's, okay, listen. All right, I'm going to show you a picture. The regulars in here are going to hate this. Why? Because we've seen it many times before. <laughs> I know it's coming. Yeah, yeah, these, yeah, two, yeah, these two ladies are... Don't give it a don't give it away. I think this is served as a really good illustration. Okay, see those two sisters there? Uh yes. Okay. Which one do you think is older? I'm gonna say the one in the back. Don't worry, it's or not the a trick one question. on the left. Oh. Uh, 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 okay. Now they're not sisters. Yeah, it says so on the URL, the doppelgangers. Right. Yeah, they're doppelgangers, okay? Now, could I convince anybody in the world who does not know them, could I convince anybody easily that those are sisters? Uh, yeah, you probably could. Right. So what do we have here? We have unity and diversity. We have two particulars, and we have unity, sisters. But the unity is not real. They're not sisters. It's simply the illusion of being sisters. So when you talk about dogs and cats and planets, whatever this is, right? These are not just proper names. These are universals. Okay, anytime you talk about properties and attributes, you're talking about universals. You could not speak intelligibly without universals. Now, either the universals are real, they've been instituted and sustained, or they're illusory, they don't exist. Therefore, the use of these universals when they're actually illusory are meaningless. So if I went around saying these sisters, they're not, they're not sisters. They're two unrelated particulars. You say, well, they have the same eyes. Well, wait a minute. Are, are, are thing particulars that are identified as eyes, are they from a common origin of causality and laws of nature? Or are eyes doppelgangers and noses and dogs and cats, are they doppelgangers? 
They ba- they both appear to be in the class of women, but one of them could be a transgender. Right. Yeah. They're not really so, so, women. So the point, yeah. So the point is, in the Christian worldview, God is the indispensable unifying first principle who creates the world. God is triune. He is three in one. He is one being, one person, and he is multi-personal. His unity and his diversity have equal ultimacy. He then creates the world, and he institutes an array of particulars, and he institutes unity among diversity as a plan, and he creates man in his image so that the world is a reflection of himself, of unity and diversity. Now, if you say, I don't need no stinking God, I don't need no Bible, say, okay. So, but then you believe you have unity among diversity in order to have intelligibility for your world. What institutes actual unity and what sustains it? Why? Because people believe it. What if everybody in the world was convinced that these were sisters? They'd be wrong. You say, oh, but we have science, we have laws. What laws? What instituted these laws? What sustains these laws? Maybe in in your world, anything can happen, and there's just a weird coincidence of consistencies, and tomorrow, the law stopped. Or some of them will continue, and some of them will stop. If, if If you can't employ the concept that the future will be like the past, then you don't have unity and diversity. Okay? If you don't have unity and diversity, you have no intelligibility. Well, if God is not the one who institutes and secures unity and diversity, then if somebody says, but there is unity among, amongst diversity in our world, say, good, what secures it? Laws of nature? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Laws of nature. Good. What institutes laws of nature? Are the laws of nature an array of particular situations that are eternal? Because if you say yes, then the question is, then they each exist independently, each other, all right? And nothing is ultimate, instituting and securing all of them, and therefore you have a chance world. And if you have a chance world, anything can happen. And if anything can happen, you have no intelligibility. So do you you realize that the biblical message is actually profoundly philosophical? But people who do not want there to be a God will just simply write it off as religious mumbo-jumbo. Why is it that you, you watch atheist YouTube shows all the time? They're constantly emoting. They're constantly moralizing. Why would you be moralizing the world that just is and anything goes and anything can happen at any time? Why would you bitch and complain? And after all, your bitching and complaining is just chance occurrences. It doesn't mean anything. You see, without God, then the bitching and complaining and whining about how people treat each other in this world by atheism, it doesn't mean anything. Okay? So the proof of God, the proof of the God of the Bible meaning his attribute and property set that is unique to him and no other view of God is that without him, you can prove nothing. You couldn't even talk about the sky being blue. You know, let me, let me show you how bad this thinking is, okay? You ever hear of Neil deGrasse Tyson? Oh, I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, I like to call him Nihilo Grabass Tyson, okay? Um, He was on Joe Rogan, and he's on TV shows all the time, and he's an atheist. He, he, He denies being an atheist, but he is. And he's asked all the time, what is one of the most profound truths that just just amazes you? And he says, we are stardust. And he says, people think I'm being metaphorical. He goes, no. He goes, we are really stardust. We, the elements in our body were forged in the furnaces of stars. 
right? Everyone goes, wow, that's so cool. Now, I'm going to show you how utterly foolish Neil uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is on his own terms, since he's an atheist. Um, So Neil deGrasse Tyson was on Joe Rogan, and he's talking about truth. Now, in the Christian worldview, truth is that which conforms to the mind of God. Okay? Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't believe in God, so he has a different basis of truth. So let, let's, let's see if his God-free world of truth is actually coherent, and let's see if he actually follows it, okay? Mr. Mr. Scientist, okay? And by the way, I, I, people think that I would talk this way behind his back. I would talk this way to his, right to his face if he were here right now, okay? Now, he told Joe Rogan there's three kinds of truth. There's objective truth, there's personal truth, and then there's political truth, okay? And by the way, not only has he repeated this, his good friend Michael Shermer repeats the same crapola, right? Now, he says objective truth are those things that we can find through observation, testing, and repeatability, and people can replicate that using other equipment, other machines, and other measurements halfway around the world and replicate it over and over and over again without exception, okay? So that's what for him is objective truth. Observation, testing, and repeatability independently, you know. Then he says personal truth is just whatever you personally devoutly believe to be true. And it doesn't have anything to do with observation, testing, and repeatability. Remember, he's he's trying to introduce this concept of empiricism, right? Because he's an empiric- empiricist. He's, a, he's a guilty of scientism. So... He says there's objective truth, there's personal truth, and then there's um, political truth. It's what the people who are in power at the time tell you what to believe and that some people just capitulate and accept it, okay? So there's objective truth, personal truth, and then political truth, right? And I've never – I've watched a lot of his conversations and lectures. I've never heard him utter that there's any other kind of truth, right? Now, when Neil deGrasse Tyson says that we are stardust, that the elements in our body were forged in the furnaces of stars, okay, that the intense heat and pressures form the higher elements, okay, which category of truth is that in? Is that objective truth? Is that personal truth? Or is it political truth? Well, I think we can all agree that it's not political truth, right? It's not the government telling us that the higher elements in our body were forged in the furnaces of stars. And it certainly wouldn't be personal truth because after all, Neil deGrasse Tyson is he's, he's, a, he's a man of truth and science, right? So I guess that leaves us with objective truth that it's observable, testable, and repeatable. How is Neil deGrasse Tyson able to test that the elements in his body, the iron in his body, were forged in the furnaces of stars? How was he able to observe and test that? Just because it may be the case that higher elements right now are forming in the furnaces of stars, it doesn't follow from that that all higher elements formed purely naturalistically, mechanistically, and materialistically. They could have formed by a fiat creation. But did he observe that the elements in his body were forged in the furnaces of stars? Did he observe that? Was it tested? Was it repeated? Anyone? Bueller? So Neil deGrasse Tyson, in his atheism and his scientism and empiricism, fails his own criterion. He's peddling materialistic religion masquerading as science. Maybe he should have lunch with Bill Nye, you know? Maybe they would get along. Well, that's right. They're both atheists. See, atheism is self-defeating, but they don't see it. You want to know why? It's because they're on the run from God. We don't need no stinking God. We got science, man. We got science! Wait, didn't you say um, Neil deGrasse Tyson says he believes in God? 
No. Neil deGrasse Tyson constantly says that he's not an atheist, but he doesn't believe in God. But he finally admitted it on Joe Rogan's show. He says, I'm an atheist, but I'm not that kind of atheist, meaning outwardly belligerent and hostile. Okay. Now, I have a I have a hunch that the reason why he doesn't come out as an atheist, because he's being sneaky and devious, just like Carl Sagan, if he were to publicly come out and say that he was an atheist, he would lo- lose significant income from public speaking um, fees because there would be people who do not want to see an outspoken atheist. Carl Sagan did the same thing. Carl Sagan said that he was not an atheist. He was an agnostic. But Carl Sagan lied because in the opening sequence of Cosmos, he says, the cosmos is all there ever is, was, and will be. Well, I'm sorry. That's atheism, okay? If you say the cosmos is all there is, was, and will be, that's atheism, okay? Okay. So, you see, atheism is self-refuting, okay? And the nice thing about recognizing that God is and the God of the Bible has revealed himself is not only you get saved from your sins when we turn to him, you get saved from absurdity and incoherence and a self-defeating worldview. Now, do you think they recognize that their worldview is self-defeating? Of course they don't because they don't want to recognize that it's self-defeating, okay? Because all they care about is one thing, preserving their autonomous reasoning or the supremacy of their own reason at all costs. And that includes psychologically deceiving yourself about God and saying, well, there's no evidence for God, right? 